Shalom Chavim. Uh, it's nice to get the chance to speak with you guys again. And uh, uh, so many things have been going on. I kind of got off course in the study that I was doing uh, when our daughter had fallen ill. Uh, but anyway, let me just kind of update you on some things that are going on here. I mentioned to you, I think, on a video recently that uh, I was asked to come on a radio broadcast, and that will actually be on uh, this coming Wednesday night at uh, 9 p.m. I think that's Central Time. And when I actually upload this video here onto the internet. I will double check the time for you on that and then I will take and um, uh, also put the information on the window as well in the beginning of the video so you know where to go. It's www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash tribulation hyphen with a little hyphen in there then the word now N-O-W now. That's the radio broadcast where we'll be at. Uh, says on here to register with Blog Talk Radio for purpose for participating in the chat room. Uh, they put on there, it's great fellowship. You would be able to go to secure.blogtalkradio.com forward slash register dot ASPX question mark TYPE type equals listener. Uh, that equals signs and then the word listener. There again, I'll put this up for you guys. There's also on Facebook, they have uh, facebook.com forward slash tribulation now. Um, and the gentleman that asked me is actually his name is, if I understand right, John uh, Baptist is his name. So uh, there again, oh, and there's a call in number. I guess they'll be taking phone calls as well uh, that night. Uh, 714 364 4355. Uh, again, blogtalkradio.com forward slash tribulation now. So if you're able to tune in, they're asking me to speak about uh, the rapture in the Torah. So I will continue to study up on that as well as review some of the notes that the Lord has shown me over the years. And there are some interesting things that I have seen. Even Chuck Missler was kind of amazed at one thing that I mentioned to him that was uh, in the, uh, the Hebrew scriptures about the rapture. Uh, that's something he had never thought about before, and uh, he found it very fascinating. So I'll be talking about those things there. I'm just going to kind of quickly go through the things that I was studying on for you here. And um, um, I really kind of got into Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51 more for the sake of the Jewish people and the covenant with the Vatican that's been underway, and because of the fact that many of the Jews uh, today because there's an outreach of Christian support, uh, but yet we get two types of support. We get the, the Christian churches that support, um, that are genuine in their hearts, that want to help the Jewish people, help the return of the Jews to Israel, contribute um, in doing that. And I'm a strong supporter of people that have that desire. I believe that this is the, um, the type of uh, Ruth, uh, in fact, in the scriptures, I believe that Ruth is a type of the Christian that helps to uh, bring back the, the, lost, uh, the lost sheep of Israel. Uh, but then there's also the, the, the different churches, though, that have more of, so to, I'd call it the feather in the hat, so to speak. Uh, they're wanting to win the Jews to Christ, and you know, it's not to say that I'm against that, but you have to understand when there's an agenda behind it. I don't think God's pleased with an agenda, um, you know, to be someone, in other words, you know, it should be more of a sincere heart uh, of the Lord there. Anyway, let's just jump into uh, uh, Isaiah, excuse me, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, Jeremiah chapter 50. I'd like to go right down to verse 28. Hark, hark uh, excuse me, they flee escape out of the land of Babylon to declare Zion, the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. Let me back up just a little bit, maybe to verse 26. Come against her from every quarter. Open her granaries, cast her up as heaps, and destroy her utterly. Let nothing of her be left. Slay all her bullocks. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe unto them, for their day has come, the time of their visitation. Hark! Thee flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion 
the vengeance of the Lord our God and the vengeance of his temple. Now, we can find in Isaiah, Yeshayahu, Shishim Vechad, Isaiah 61, uh, and um, I don't, let's see, no, I don't have the Tanakh with me to give my Jewish brethren the corresponding, but uh, in, in the Hebrew, but anyway, uh, in Yeshayahu 61, uh, Shishim Vechad in English, that would be. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prisons to, them, uh, uh, to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, when Yeshua read this in the temple when he was here on the earth, couple of thousand years ago he got to the middle of verse 2 he put the scroll down and he said to the people this day is this scripture fulfilled in your hear in your hearing and uh, and he didn't go on to read the rest of the verse but the rest of the verse and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn is a future event that would be fulfilled in Israel. And this is what we're finding in the book of Jeremiah right here in verse 28 when he says, uh, and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God. What vengeance is he speaking about? The Vatican makes a covenant with Israel, the very ones that killed the prophets, including Yeshua, including Jesus, he was also killed by the Romans. Now, Israel um, offered up Christ as the sacrifice, which was handed him over to the Romans. But the thing is, is the Romans did more than what they should have done. You know, they couldn't just be satisfied with, with crucifying him according to their capital punishment, but they beat him beyond recognition. And this is something that God has never forgotten. In fact, uh, I believe in Revelation, it speaks about all the blood of the prophets were found in her and the righteous and the saints, uh, which would be the Christians. But he says, escape out of the land of Babylon. Get out of there. Get out of those churches like that. Uh, to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord. He's going to let Israel know, I'm taking out vengeance, and that's right there according to Isaiah 61 verse 2, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, who are mourning. He's not talking about those mourning for the Vatican when it's destroyed. He's talking about the Jews when they recognize that Yeshua is indeed Moshiach. That's what the mourning is all about. Okay? Uh, you'd also see this in Daniel 9, 26 as well. This is the, the pardoning of the sins. That's, that's why the mourning comes in. Uh, Zechariah, I believe, chapter 12 as well. We would find that as well in Zechariah. Now, let's just go a little further. Um, then he goes on to say, you know, call together the archers against Babylon and them that bend the bow and camp against her round about. Let none of them escape. Recompense her according to her work, according to all that she has done, do unto her. For she hath been arrogant against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel, that's Yeshua. Therefore shall her young men fall into her broad places, and her men of war shall be brought to silence in that day, saith the Lord, or Hashem. Skip down to verse 33. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel and the children of Judah are oppressed together, and all took them, uh, and all they that took them captives hold them fast. They refuse to let them go. <laughs> so we realize, even from this verse here, this destruction of Babylon is after 70 AD. Because he speaks about both the house of Israel and the house of Judah being taken captive, and the, 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 those that are holding them captive refuse to let them go. And of course, Russia uh, swore, Stalin said he had never let the Jews go. And of course, Hitler the same, that none of these would let them go. Um, their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He is... He will, he will thoroughly plead their cause that, uh, that he may give rest to the earth and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword is upon the Chaldeans, that say, saith the Lord, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon, upon her princes and upon her wise men. Uh, a sword is upon the boasters, they shall become fools. A sword is upon her mighty men and they shall be dismayed. Um, 
Uh, of course, also at verse 38, which is kind of interesting as well, skipping down another verse. A drought is upon her waters, and they shall be dried up, for it is a land of graven images, and they are mad upon things of horror. And there again, we can't help but think of the Vatican and all the graven images and, and what they're into. If you think about the horror, I don't know if you guys have ever known about the different uh, secrets that have been revealed about cloistered convents of the Vatican and how that they would keep the nuns and beat them um, as part of their penance, way of penance uh, in a cloister convert, convent. Once a nun goes to a cloister convent, she's never seen again. And believe me, the nuns that go in there wish they would have never taken that uh, black veil. If you do some, there's a woman by the name of Charlotte, I can't think of her last name, uh, incredible story um, that uh, escaped a cloistered convent and uh, wrote actually a little book about it. Uh, it's very difficult to find, but if you can find that book, uh, I guarantee you one thing, when you go to read it, you won't put it down. You won't, I have read it myself. Just horrifying book itself. Behold, a, uh, let's go to verse 41. Behold, a people cometh from the north, and a great nation of many kings shall be roused from the uttermost parts of the earth. They lay hold uh, on a bow and spear. They are cruel and have no compassion. Their voice is like the roaring sea, and they ride upon horses set in array as a man of war against the old daughter of Babylon. Um, that's kind of interesting, daughter of Babylon. I'm not really sure um, what we have in that right there. Uh, if we drop down to verse 46, at the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth quaketh, and the cry is heard among the nations. Now that's interesting in itself. Uh, for my Jewish brethren, if you, if you have a Christian Bible, if you do not, um, let me just share with you something that John, the Jewish writer John, wrote in Revelation 18, verse 9. Uh, he says, The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxurious with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. So even John recognizes that this Babylon, of course he calls it in Revelation 17, 5, Misty Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. Uh, mother of harlots. A lot of different denominational systems were birthed off of that. So possibly this is what we have right here. Uh, let's go right on into uh, Jeremiah chapter 51. Uh, Revel uh, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in Leb Kami, a destroying wind, and I will send unto Babylon strangers that shall fan her. They shall empty her land, for in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about. I cannot say for sure, but I, 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 there's something that was very interesting when I read this. Um, I couldn't help but think of Revelation 11.3, the two witnesses. And when I say that, in Isaiah 61.5, and I don't know if I've got that with me here in the Hebrew language. Let me see. Yes, I do. Isaiah 61, 5. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. See, in Hebrew it says, Zerim uh, Veroa, excuse me. Uh, the Zerim are your, are your strangers. And. And I, I don't know if there's a correlation to this or not, but it's interesting to mention. And I will send into Babylon strangers that shall fan her. And of course, there again, Zerim, Zerim, see, the strangers that are coming, and it's plural. And could it be that it's the two, two witnesses? And there again, speculation, I can't say for sure. Uh, I found it very interesting uh, uh, as far as it could it be possibly the two witnesses. Uh, something let me uh, mention to you. Uh, those of you that may not understand, why would God send two witnesses? Well, it's probably, you guys, probably most of you guys would know this anyway, but it's a Levitical law. Uh, oh, when I say Levitical law, it is, it is Mosaic law, is what we would say, uh, Jewish law. It was in in uh, Deuteronomy 19, uh, ver, chapter 19, verse 15, one witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commit, 
by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. And this is why God brings two witnesses, because before God will judge the whore, the great harlot Babylon, he has to bring two witnesses to account for that sin against her. And in this case here, these two witnesses are witnesses of her sins down through the ages as well. So another reason why there's two witnesses. And there again, another reason why I would lean more towards Moses and Elijah, because Moses and Elijah are seen on Mount Transfiguration with Yeshua. So therefore, we realize they have been able to watch the sins of the Vatican unfold for the last 2,000 years, or not 2,000 years, and uh, I guess more like about 1,600 years the Vatican's been in, into power there. So just a little thought for you there. Uh, let the archer bend his, uh, his bow against her, and let him lift himself up against her in his coat of mail, and spare ye not uh, her young men, destroy ye utterly all her host. And they shall fall down slain in the land of the Chaldeans, and thrust through in her streets. For Israel is not widowed, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, for their land is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel." That is something that should strike the heart of every uh, replacement theologist that is out there. Notice what God has said here. For Israel is not widowed. Her husband's not dead. God is not dead. Nor Judah. Both houses, both the house of Israel and the house of Judah, neither one of them are widowed. God is not dead of his God, of the Lord of hosts, for their land is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel. In other words, even though they have the blood guilt of Moshiach on their hands, yet God, he's not divorced them. He's, they're, they're, they're not widowed from God. They're still married. And I thought that was fascinating when I read that. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and save every man his life. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for it is the time of the Lord's vengeance he will render unto her recompense. Notice it keeps talking about fleeing out, coming out of Babylon and everything. You know, my children, uh, I think in Revelation, I think it's 18, 4, it says, come out of her, my people. Now, there are those that believe that that is referring to the Christian people coming out of it, and, and I would agree that that can have a compound meaning. I'm not going to say that's not, but it really specifically is referring to Israel because why? Israel makes the covenant with the Vatican. And just like with Ezra, when you read in the story of Ezra, when Ezra come along and found out that, that they had made these marriages with, with the pagan women during Babylon, he cried out against it. He was against that. And he told them, divorce them. You can't be a part of that. You have to be separated from that. And so therefore, God, when, when Israel goes and makes his covenant with the Vatican, he commands them to come out of that. Because God won't accept that. So anyway, we find uh, uh, verse 8. Let's go to verse 8. But uh, Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed well for her. Take balm for her pain, if, if so be she may be healed. Revelation 18.3. Uh, that's when all nations will actually well and lament over the Vatican being destroyed. Uh, we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go, every one into his own country. For a judgment reaches into heaven and is lifted up even into the skies. Um, uh, you know, another thing that's very interesting to me, if you go to verse 11, um, make the bright, the arrows fill the quivers. The Lord hath roused the spirit of the kings of the Medes because he... His device against Babylon to destroy it, for it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Do you get what he's, there's two, that's, that's a compound meaning right here. Because Babylon, the Vatican, Rome in this case here, for, for, for an example, the Titus, the Roman general, come and destroyed the temple when it was here on the earth. And the Vatican hails him as a hero. Look it up. You can find it easily on the internet. They held Titus as a hero. They got a monument there in Rome of him carrying the menorah and the different temple treasures back to Rome, and they hail him as a hero. 
And they say that, that when they show the menorah on there, that he was passing the light from the Jew to the Gentile. And yet God says right here uh, that he is, you know, he's angry about this. The vengeance of his temple. But it also speaks of Moshiach. When Yeshua was crucified and the way they crucified him and beat him beyond recognition, the Roman. Don't think that, I mean, the Vatican is the descendants of the Romans. Just like Israel, just like the Jews, bit the cup. Remember when, when, when Joseph put the cup in Benjamin's bag? And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the brothers are going back home. And on the way back home, they're overtaken by the servant. Joseph's servant overtakes him and he says, why have you required it evil for good? And they're like, what do we do? What do we do? See, Yeshua come and he gave his life for Israel. And instead of them receiving him gladly, they treated him evilly. Just like Joseph's brothers did. Sold him out, throwing him in the ditch and everything. But when they finally come down, when, when the tribulation sets in, and notice it's interesting, two years into it, two years into that tribulation, that's seven years, that's when they finally recognize who Joseph is. But before they recognize him, they sit down, they have a dinner with him, not knowing that it's him. And as he leaves, he puts the grain back in their bag, but he puts his cup in Benjamin's bag. Now, Benjamin was never guilty of selling out Joseph. Neither are the Jews today guilty of selling out Yeshua when he was here on the earth 2,000 years ago. But ironically, the cup is in their bag. The cup was in Benjamin's bag. The one that was innocent was held responsible for selling out Joseph. And the same thing today, the Jews of today, we are found with the cup of Yeshua in our bag and we're not guilty of his blood. But why is that cup there? The cup is there to find out what will we do with this Yeshua? Korei Moshiach. What do we do? Maoseh in Yeshua, Kohe Moshiach. What do we do with this Jesus called Christ? The cup is in our bag. It's in our hand. What are we going to do with it? It's up to us. And this is when his brothers begin to repent. They begin to realize what they had done. Then they were not willing to let them take the blame. But it was too late. The cup was in his bag. So we're responsible of what we're going to do with this. And I find that interesting. So, you know, the vengeance of his temple actually is going to fall on Babylon. The judgment. Because they're the ones that actually did the work. Let's jump down to verse 13. O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundant in treasures, thine end is come, the measure of thy covetousness. See, he's identifying who it is. And all you have to do is go to uh, Revelation, I believe, 17, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, John's writing. You know, you can go, go back and forth through the Torah, to the Tanakh, and, and through the Christian scriptures. And this is what I find interesting. Many of my Jewish brethren, if they just take the time to read the Christian Bible, you'd be amazed at how many things will dovetail, and, and it'll answer things for us. Like, we sit here and we read this here, not knowing the Christian Bible. Oh, thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundance of treasures. Well, we know the Vatican's abundant in treasures, but we don't really put two and two together. But then you look over here. Then one on the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth commit fornication and the inhabitants of the earth 
uh, made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet beast, which is full of blasphemous names. Hang on, let me just see real quick here. Uh, we have to drop all everything, I think, down to verse 15. Then he said, The waters which thou sawest, this is Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, the waters which thou sawest, saw, where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And of course, that's what the Vatican does. She's in every country in the world. So she sits on uh, the hill of many nations. Even the Arabic countries have Catholics. Um, amazing. So uh, he that made, uh, uh, excuse me, so anyway, the Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, surely I will fill thee with men as with canker worm, and they shall lift up a shout against thee. Can't help but think about Jericho when you hear that scripture. Uh, moving on down, verse 16. In the second of his giving a multitude of waters in the heavens, he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings at the time of the rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Um, I have Revelation 14 2 marked here. I don't know why I did that, but we'll skip that for right now. Uh, verse 17. Every man is proved to be brutish for the knowledge of every goldsmith is put to shame by the graven image that his molten image is falsehood and there is no breath in them that's what's going to happen when they find out that all these all these images all these idols and everything they've made for all these saints saint cecilia and all the everything else they got out there gosh knows how many they have out there uh, but uh, our God knows how many they have, and it's just nothing. It's all vanity. They are vanity, a work of delusion. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. Uh, moving on down to verse 22, And with thee I will shatter the horse and his rider. Now that is interesting. That's also another reason why I wondered about the strangers that would fan them, they would fan that as being part of the two witnesses, because... That's what Moses says in Exodus 15, 1, when he says, He says, I will sing. I will, um, let me just real quick take you over to Shemoth, Exodus 15. And this is why, uh, uh, Rashi, all the great sages knew this. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord. It's a future tense, by the way. He has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. There's your inner Christ spirit. There's the one in Revelation that rides that horse. Notice there's, there's I think there's four horses in Revelation. I think there's also in the same thing in Zechariah. I don't have time to go into that right now, but it uh, it looks like the same rider. It's just a, it's just a, a spirit of the devil, and uh, but he's finally destroyed. But we find him in Babylon. Interesting. In the Vatican, in the church there, he's found in the Vatican. Vatican. Um, so that's in verse 21. Let's drop down to verse 26. And they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundation, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. Um, it makes me wonder if the Vatican isn't going to try to offer one of their own stones as a cornerstone for the temple. I have no idea. Set you up a standard in the land, blow the horn among the nations, prepare the nations against her, call together against her the kingdom of Arat, Mini, and Ashkenaz, appoint a marshal against her, cause the horses to come up as the rough canker worm. And um, again, I'm just trying to quickly go through here because I wanted to share some things with you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to drop down. We're fixing the end for the for tonight, uh, but let me just bring you down here again. Another another interesting one again. And this, there, like I said, Revelation 18, 4 says, Come out of her, my people, according to John, the writer of the New Testament. Uh, my people, this is, in, this is in the 45th verse of Ezekiel, excuse me, Jeremiah 51. My people, go you out of the midst of her and save yourselves, every man, from the fierce anger of the Lord. And too many. And let not your heart faint, neither fear ye, for the rumor... Oh, gosh, this is something I meant to tell you guys about. Yes, I totally forgot about this. Uh, let not your heart faint, neither fear ye, for the rumor that shall be heard in the land 
for a rumor shall come one year, and after that in another year a rumor, and violence in the land, ruler against ruler. Now think about Jesus in Matthew 24, uh, when Yeshua was speaking on this. Let me just real quick take you to that. This was something that I caught that I found just fascinating. In Matthew 24, verse 6 here. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you be not soon troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes and and uh, and, and various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by, by all nations for my name's sake. See, that's Israel's going to be hated. All right? Now notice, though, Jesus talked about this rumors of, uh, of wars, wars and rumors of wars, and I used to always think, you know, like Russia threatening to blow up America, things like that, has nothing to do with that. Just cross-reference it, we find out right here in... Ezekiel, excuse me, Jeremiah 51, verse 46. And after that, let's see, back it up a little bit. Um, hang on, my apology here. And let not your heart faint, neither fear ye, for the rumor that shall be heard in the land, for a rumor shall come one year. After that, in another year, a rumor. And violence in the land, ruler against ruler. Therefore, behold, the days come that I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon, and her whole land shall be ashamed, and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. So it's like there's two years of rumors, and then that violence comes. And of course, that's where Jesus speaks of nation against nation and ruler against ruler. But we can look and see what he says, and he goes a little bit further with it. See? Um, verse, let's see. Don't, you don't have to be troubled with the rumor. And that's what they're saying. That's what Jeremiah says. See that thou you be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and then will then, then there will be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. That's when it's going to get really ugly at that point there. Then the heaven of the earth and all that, uh, verse 48, Jeremiah 51, that is therein shall sing for joy over Babylon, for the spoiler shall come unto her from the north, saith the Lord. And I do believe, I'm not mistaken, when the in Revelation, when it talks about the Vatican being destroyed, it says, all ye saints of God rejoice, for God has avenged your blood upon them. Even the, Israel. And in in the, in the, in the Christian martyrs, you know, rejoice. As Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the land. Ye that have escaped the sword, go you stand not still. Remember the Lord from afar off. Yet Jerusalem come into your let Jerusalem come into your mind. Let me look real quick. I marked also Ezekiel 7, chapter 7. We're going to end right here. Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 25. I want to see real quick what I marked or why I marked it. I, like I said, I kind of got away from this for a little bit, so my mind is not fresh on, on all these things. Um, destruction comes. They will seek peace, but there shall be none. Disaster will come upon disaster, and rumor will be upon rumor. Then they will seek a vision from a prophet. Wow. But the law will perish from the priest and council, from the elders. The king will mourn. The prince will be uh, clothed with desolation, and the hands of the common people will tremble. I will do then according to their way, and according to uh, what they deserve, I will judge them. Then they shall know that I am Hashem. God bless you, my friends. And... Uh, Let's pick back up, uh, like I said, if you want, uh, watch that radio show on blogtalkradio.com forward slash tribulation now, and uh, I will load these, this information up for you there. And until we get to speak again, be praying. Pray with all your heart, for our redemption does draw nigh. God bless you.